Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Move podcast brought to you by Aura Ring, as it is each and every episode. I got the crew today. We're talking about the world championships, all of it, not just today's exceptional performance by Julian Alaphilippe. Over there in Madrid, we got Johan Bernil. Over there in Austin, we are totally socially distanced, by the way. Austin got J.B. Hager. George appears to be in Columbia, but he's not. He's in Greenville, South Carolina. Isn't that right, George? That's correct. You really do look like you're in some swanky place in Columbia. <laughs> you still haven't gone to Columbia. You're promising a trip out there. So um, I'll, I'll hopefully get to show you it sometime in the near future. I, I would love that. As I said, today's show brought to you by Aura Ring. This, these guys just continue, guys and gals, just continue to crush as a technology and as a business. Uh, we talked during the tour how they uh, had just announced the partnership with, uh, with the UFC on the heels of the partnership with the NBA, the WNBA, NASCAR. Um, I love the product. Uh, it, it, it gives me so much data, not just through the night, but through the day in terms of activity score, readiness score. Um, one of the cool things about the UFC partnership, and I've got, if you guys and gals go over to Daniel Cormier's uh, Instagram, that whole partnership came to be because uh, Cormier was eventually diagnosed with COVID. Uh, he actually saw it coming through the ring. And so he, and I'll just sh shine this up here. So here's a day before, right? Readiness score is 77. Resting heart rate through the night, 52. Core temp was below, was 0.1 below. Next day, heart rate, 12 beats higher. Core temp up, uh, up almost three degrees. Readiness score way down in the 40s. He knew he was getting sick. I mean, that, that's how amazing this little piece of tech is. Um, head on over to AuraRing.com and check it out. Also, today's show brought to you by Element. I love this brand. Um, I'm a big fan. It's not, I got no skin in the game, as I always say. It's, it's, a, it's my go-to product for hydration. Um, it's, it's got, what is it, 1,000 milligrams of sodium, 200 milligrams of potassium, 60 milligrams of magnesium. It's just loaded. Uh, I even turned George onto it during the tour. Uh, no sugar, no coloring, no funky ingredients. Um, money back guarantee. If you don't like it, they said give it to a salty friend. And we all have a lot of salty friends. Head on over to drinklmnt.com slash the move. Last one, and then we'll get into talking about the world championships, all of them. Um, today's show also brought to you by Hyper Ice. These guys, and I've been a big fan. Look at this thing. I know y'all want me to turn this on and put it on my head right now. Uh, I might be needing to put it on my finger because I was out dirt biking yesterday and I fell over a stupid little crash. Look at this thing. This thing's turning black. I mean, this whole finger is going to be black. I can't move it. Um, but Hyper Ice has, has been a, a, a brand and a product that I've just been buying online for years. Uh, they've got, uh, and they've also just recently purchased Normatech, which is super popular in the cycling space. Uh, this is the Hypervolt. This thing, I'm telling you, this is the new head. This is the go-to for any ache or pain you have. Um, they also have the, the vibrating foam roller, the vibrating five-inch ball. It's, uh, it's next level. I, I love this company. Um, it is, uh, like I said, I keep it, I travel with it everywhere I go. I keep it in my sack. It's the go-to. Uh, head on over to HyperIce, that's H-Y-P-E-R-I-C-E.com, HyperIce.com. Type in the code HYPETHEMOVE for 10% off. There's also 50 bucks off some percussion devices, 300 bucks off all Normatec packages. We cranked up those Normatecs uh, on the rest day during the tour, and George, he, he, they were too tight for him. He, he was complain whining. I was whining. The, man's was a, not, the man is just not committed. I hadn't done it before. Is their new hip uh, feature, whatever it is, but it goes around your hip and your lower back, and it was uh, pretty intense. I think uh, mm. I'll need to give it another try. We're questioning your commitment. Head on over to hyperice.com. So let's get into it. So this is, a, look, we know this is a weird year. Uh, sporting events are somehow uh, back on, which, um, you know, for people that like to sit around and watch sports, it's a good thing. Uh, the Worlds were actually scheduled to be in Egla, Switzerland. They were uh, moved due to COVID down to Imola, uh, which is the F1 track in Italy. We were, we were treated to an exceptional performance by Julian Alaphilippe today. There's been a bunch of other big headlines that we'll get into. But, man, this Alaphilippe, what a bike racer. I tell you, 
uh, the, 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 this guy is, he's always up, man. He's always just like, fuck, put a number on him. I, God, I, there's 20 bucks. Is that 20 bucks? I, can't let you I, just, I just said the F bomb. That's 20 for the swear jar, 20 to a charity of our choice. Um, I'm going to go broke saying bad words, but this kid, you put a number on his back and he's like, let's go race. Uh, it, it's, it's awesome. He correct me if I'm wrong. He did the Tour de France, right? And didn't how do we end the last show of the, the Tour de France last week, where I said Uh-oh. somebody from the Tour de France <laughs> will win the worlds, and you absolutely disagreed with me. Well, I did. you look at the final group of what was it, six, seven guys. Everybody was in there that did the tour, except one guy at Full Sang. Well, as you know, and everybody knows, and everybody on the show here knows, I'm never right, and everybody else is right. Uh, is always right. Um, I just, you know, based on my experience, I, I always, and I was just trying to live it through going, you know, a week after the tour, like my body's, it's not going to get up for a 160 mile race, 258 kilometer race. But I think it really speaks to the, uh, fitness and, and, and of the Peloton. And this is just a different sport. Now these guys, um, and gals, uh, the, they're just, whether, I don't know what, you know, the training, all the data they're getting. Clearly, I was, you know, I was wrong. And um, you know, I'm sorry uh, to, 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 to the folks that sympathize with me, which are few and far between. But I, I, I think it's just a different sport. Yeah, Yohan, you probably have a, a better perspective on this, but man, none of those people look like they were tired from the Tour de France. Yeah, I mean, I think Philippe, obviously, I think he finished the Tour uh, the last three, four days probably know, thinking about the Tour de France, about the World Championships already. Um, you know, if you see a guy like Roglic, he was he was up there, but he was struggling. And then you have, you know, it's a it, today was a mix. You know, there was the guys who came good out of the Tour de France, and then the guys who are preparing for the Giro. Fuglsang is obviously in great shape, so that that promises. But you know, if you compare to the past, uh, typically San Sebastian was always the race, which is one week after the Tour de France, and you know, lately, except last year or even a pool one, but lately it's always been uh, a rider who comes out of the Tour de France. One of them, by the way, was Philippe two years ago. He did a great, uh, not three years ago, he did uh, a great Tour de France and he won San Sebastian. So I, th- I guess you could compare it a little bit with, you know, finishing the Tour and go race San Sebastian. The difference, yes. Johan, would be for, for San Sebastian is, as we all know, it's a very difficult race, but it's all in those last couple of climbs where the world is a race of attrition. Mm. There, when you have a course that hard, typically what's going to happen is going to go really slow at the start. All the favorites are just saving up. My guess is none of those top Tour de France guys felt that great coming into the Worlds, but they have that extra gear. After you do a Grand Tour, you might not be feeling great, but when the shit starts hitting fat after 220 kilometers, you have that extra gear, and you're not as yeah. tired as the guys that don't have that base in there. And you saw it today. I mean, these guys completely just rode away from everybody. And uh, like I said, they probably weren't feeling great, but once everybody else was completely done after 220, 230K, that's when they're able to make a difference. Yeah, yeah. But I think we should also, I mean, you know, he didn't, uh, he didn't finish with a, a good result, but what a rider is Tadej Pogacar. I mean, yeah. 42 yeah. kilometers to go, he just lights it up. I think, you know, the deal was that he was, he was definitely sacrificing himself for Primoz Roglic, who was finally there with the best. But man, I mean, what a spectacular rider and, and, you know, having those kind of that initiative and at some point, you know, he was going and they were, the, he blew, he blew up the Belgian team. You know, the Belgians were in pretty much in control and he just blew them up. You know, it's, it's um, just for the, the, the listener at home, uh, I think it's worth pointing out, you know, to me, there's always, you know, these guys and gals race all year long for a trade team. So they race for, you know, a, a commercial sponsor and that's who pays their bills. Um, and that's where their, their loyalty lies. Um, it's their job. And so the world's is just, a, and the Olympics for that matter are, di- are different. You race for the national team. So while you'll still wear, you'll have some signage or logoage of your trade team sponsor, you're wearing the national team Jersey. So it's, it's a different dynamic because, I mean, in theory, you should be racing. If, you, if you're on the French team, you're racing uh, for France. And so, but there's always, uh, it's fun to think about the, the political, you know, uh, issue might come up if, if you, um, you know, where does your loyalty lie? I mean, you're, it's one day you're wearing a different jersey, but at the end of the day, you know, somebody's turning on your lights for you 
we didn't we did not see it today we've seen it in the past but if you if you don't if you didn't watch the race if you just catch it it'll look different right you'll see uh you'll you'll see different jerseys and different looks yeah it's difficult to recognize the riders also you know i mean because and on top of that these national selections sometimes they change the way they're i mean france is normally always the same belgium italy you know the typical uh, spain but you know sometimes you have these riders that we used to see in their trade team and they ride for a small country and like for example today carapaz you know carapaz was up there and I mean, I could recognize him because of his style, but not because, I mean, the jersey was completely different. And I mean, personally, I think I'm, I'm a little bit, uh, I mean, the, the World Championships is obviously a special race. And, and today we had a rider who is definitely going to be a very worthy world champion. I mean, mm-hmm. this, this is a jersey he's wearing all year. And you can say, okay, he is definitely one of the best, if not the best rider of the world. Um, but that's not that's not usual. I mean, you can have a race where basically somebody wins and is the world champion and he's just the best that specific day. So um I would I would want to see the world championships uh being raced by trade teams. I think it would m- make much more sense than, there's been, than, than yeah, today. The, the, that there's always been talk of that and then maybe save the Olympics for the national teams. But mm-hmm. um I, know, I would I, love for you for you guys to explain some of uh, some of that process. Like how are these teams selected? Who's in charge? Do they have a director? Uh, I, I don't think they were using radios because Alaphilippe kept wanting the time check, but explain some of those differences and how you end up on a world champion team. Who wants to go in there? No, George, you, you, you know this better than... Sure, I mean, it's, it's just a question of, you know, how, how you're riding throughout the year. Um, obviously, in the case of the Americans, there's only a handful of guys that can actually race in Tour de France, so that's a much easier selection. Somebody like the Italians or the Spanish or the French, as we saw today, it's based on their performance to the Tour de France mostly, and some guys perhaps that weren't at the Tour that were really um, sort of keying off of the World Championships. They're in, in, in touch with the director, the national team director, which in this case for France was Thomas Beauclair, which, who, who Lance and I raced with a bunch, and you know he's a uh, in constant contact with these guys, even though they're all spread out, all on different teams. And there's a plan in place of, say, eight guys to race the world championships. They have a you know a short list of 15 that they'll kind of minimize that a week or two before the race. Yeah, for example, like Thibaut Pinot, for example, he uh, during the Tour de France, he, he, he said he wasn't feeling well. So he, you know, he said, I'm giving up my place for somebody else. But, you know, I think um, obviously it's the, it's the national federations who make the selection and, you know, seeing the world championships by trade teams, we, we, you know, we can wish for it. We're never going to see it, you know, because it's, it's never going to happen. This is the, this event is the, the UCI's main source of income. So, you know, I mean, normally I think they, this is also why they fought so hard to have it, to have it, you know, even, even at the last minute, they found the solution. And this, this is seven to 10 million uh, revenue for the UCI, seven to 10 million euros in, in TV rights and stuff. But I think the the, the difficulty for a, for a, uh, a director of a national team is how you do, how do you form a team? How do you form a team spirit? Because now Alaphilippe is the world champion. He's going to wear that jersey ra- racing the, le- the rest of the season and next year with the world championships jersey for his straight team. And the others have nothing. So there is a lot of things going on behind the scenes. First of all, in the case of a rider like Alaphilippe, like a strong leader who has a big contract, he obviously, before the race, he promises uh, a bonus for all the other guys. So they're going to earn money thanks yeah. to Alaphilippe. And then a federation, depending on I mean, if it's one of those bigger federations, they also promise a bonus because that's the only thing that can basically form a team because they're rivals the rest of the year. Well, here, no, I mean, exactly. yeah, Alaphilippe races for Quick Step, a Belgian team. I'd have mm-hmm. to go look into the start list. He probably didn't have any riders on the French national team that were that are on Quick Step. So you got there was seven, no, yeah, there was no, team, there was no teammates of him on the French team. Right. So seven guys that is to your point, Johan. Um, and by the way, too, just for uh, clarification or for just a little bit of detail here. So a country like France, Italy. Um, et cetera, they had, they, they're allowed eight riders in the race. Right. And it's all based on the world ranking. Um, for example, uh, us here in the U S we had four riders, um, e- equal to, uh, that cycling powerhouse of New Zealand. 
Um, and so it, it, based on the world ranking, that's, that determines how many Mexico had one rider, Belarus had one rider, you know, uh, uh, Ecuador had one rider. Um, so it's all based on that. So that's, that dictates, I mean, imagine if you had, if we had a great, um, um, if we had a, a, a favorite or somebody that could potentially win, he'd be there with three teammates. So that, that right there changes the whole dynamic of, of any bike race, as opposed to a team that's got twice as many men as you and women. Um, and so it's, it's, you, you know, you immediately start on, on the back foot. Yeah. And how do they determine, yeah. uh, again, like just how do you determine who's going to be your leader for your country? If it's a toss up. Well, in France, I mean, the, 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 that's an easy one, right? Yeah. And the, for example, was clearly riding for Wout Van Aert. We'll get into his race. He looked amazing. This guy just continues to impress. Um, but no, no, I don't think, I mean, we'd have to go down the list. Um, but I, I th- it seems to me that every country uh, represented today had a clear-cut favorite on their team. Yeah, yeah maybe just maybe just Italy. Italy probably was a bit of a doubt. There was not re- nobody really mm-hmm. standing out. And, you know, you could also see Italy, you know, I mean, they – they didn't really have a plan. They were just there and, you know, Nibali was okay. And then uh, probably Ulisi was okay. And um, what's the, the guy on uh, Caruso Caruso. was okay, but you know, they're not people. I mean, maybe Nibali, yes, but the other two, they're not used to basically wear the responsibility of a team. So uh, for, I mean, for the rest, it's, it's, I think it's pretty clear. Belgium was, you know, there was no doubt that Van Aert had the best chances in France. It was the same. Spain, it was Lambda and, and Valverde. So it's the usual suspects, you know? Well, when you have a country like Belgium and you have the Olympic champion out there driving the pace, <laughs> that tells you uh, they feel pretty good about Wout van Aert's chances. And he was, you know, he was close, but he just, I mean, Alaphilippe was just exceptional when he went away on the final climb. Um, it was, you know what he said? He said, he looked back and said, I'll see you in douches. <laughs> not, only, not only that, but... Uh... You know, these guys are all pros. These guys know how they're feeling. And I, I'm sure some of the tactics even changed on the road where, you know, even though Greg said he was going to work for about, I'm sure in his mind, he thought, well, if I'm good, I'm still going to try. But you saw early on with 50K to go, he was at the front doing the work. And, you know, like Lance mentioned, it was pretty, pretty clear cut who the favorites were for today's race. And, and you know what we love? First of all, I love circuit races. You get to see the course. Um, it's especially when it's hard like this, this is a very difficult course, 16,000 feet of vertical climbing, 160 miles. You know, we don't, nobody needs to go to bed tonight worrying that the best man didn't win. I mean, it was, it was when it's that hard, there was no funny breakaway, no lucky chances. I mean, the best man won, which is shit. That's the way you want. God, it's another 20 bucks. God. <laughs> shoot yeah i was gonna bring up the i was gonna bring up the circuit thing i'm glad you brought it up i wondered if riders like that because you get a look at the course again and again and again so when you do get to that last lap or two people they have a plan and they know the course i think i I always liked it yeah it's a mad it's the world championships that's what you're you know kind of you expect for a race like that and it's not a matter of what if they like it or not. It's a matter of they have legs or not at the end. And, you know, today there's only a handful of guys that can go there on the final lap. And JB, mm-hmm. there's a whole strategy there when you have a circuit like that, especially one that's this difficult. Because if you, I don't know, I have to go look how many laps they did exactly. Nine, nine laps. Nine laps. So you guys will remember this. I remember uh, one of the greats that we raced with, Rolf Sorensen, who was a, always was was trying to win the worlds. Uh, but when you see it over and over, so Rolf would start literally in the first three guys. So for the first five laps, right. let's say on these difficult climbs, he'd start right at the front and you'd see him just slip and slip. And he would literally finish the climb knowing that the race is still a long ways to go. It doesn't matter if you're in the back, he'd start at the front and just drift back and just set, I mean, you're probably, you know, 40 Watts less or whatever, and just fall through the Peloton end up at the tail end and then the rest of the circuit, he'd move up, he'd do it again. And then boom, all of a sudden when, you know, when it mattered, he was at the front and stayed at the front. That's so you can play conservation. Let's just call it strategies like that on a circuit. Whereas, you know, if it's out on the open road, you you could get screwed doing that. You also want tour Flanders doing the same technique, but it's also very risky. I mean, you go from the front and it's in a circuit like the one today in Imola is very windy, very twisty. This crashes, everything has to go perfect for that strategy to work because you add on risk and you add on danger. 
I want to know from you guys, how was it that uh, when Philippe went, you have a chase group, you're talking 12 seconds at a certain point, the Fuglesong, Van Art, Hirschi, Kwiatkowski, and Roglic cannot chase down Philippe. What was the conversation in that group or lack thereof? Well, if, if, if Walt Van Art isn't there, then they, they can chase him down. For sure. Yeah. They look at each other and they, you know, oh, we're all a bunch of skinny dudes. Uh, you know, somebody's going to win. Good luck, everybody. When you got Wild Von Art there, you're crazy. Nobody's, they're taking half pulls. They look at him and go, dude, you're going to smoke us in the sprint. This is up to you. It's your responsibility. Mm-hmm. You have to carry the weight of the race. I mean, that, that's, and, and that's what they should do. I mean, and, you know, obviously, you know, for him, he's not going to just sit on the front and pull six guys to the line and use all the energy and then get beat by some scrawny climber. Um, so that's, that, that dynamic happens all the time. And, and just a quick shout out, Mark Hershey, as you just said, JB, boy, this kid, uh, he looks, this kid's a, this is a bike racer too. Hmm. Yeah. That, that chase group behind, that was legit. Those guys, um, were motoring and, and, but in the back of their head, they're thinking we can't put everything into this chase because we're going to get beat by Wild Menard. So but Wild actually took the bull by the horns, and he did some major efforts there coming in the last 10 kilometers over the tops of the climbs where he would just go all in for three, four, five hundred meters. And, uh, I mean, the guys had so much power, and you saw how easy he won the sprint. He was uh, he would have been the, the winner had uh, Philippe been closer. Or yeah. had he had uh, – you, you kind of sit here and say, should they have saved – uh, uh, GVA a little bit, Greg Menard, right? The Olympic champion. Could he have made that group? And then, you know, cause then you roll it out where he has a guy, a, a, an engine like that. That changes the dynamic. Yeah. But I think, I think that, you know, seeing the composition, seeing who was there, I don't think Greg Van Avermaet would have made it. You know, it's, it was it's just, they were all climbers, you know, they were all now, climbers now, and, you you do realize that his biggest fan is on the show with us. Right I, I know. Now. So I know, I just, I know. I'd be very sensitive yeah. about about the way you talk about him. Yeah, uh, uh, George has a personal affinity, um, <laughs> a quasi man crush on GBA, and so just be careful. Right. Yeah. No. No. I I like I like Greg. I like Greg. He's a great writer. He's a great. But you know, he if he's listening, and I know he's listening uh, to our show, he's uh, he, he knows there was no way he could be there. The, these guys were just you know top 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 climbers. Yeah. Greg actually came to Greenville before the world's in Richmond and stayed at my house here uh, for a week. And he's just, it was amazing have, watching him interact with my kids. In fact, I think three days, I think Wednesday, he was leaving for the world's that afternoon. And uh, I got home and there's nobody there. And I go in the backyard, he's playing soccer with my son. And so I'm like, dude, <laughs> you got the world's in three days. Stop, go inside. I don't want to see you playing soccer with my son. And right you now. guys probably did some long walks together. <laughs> Lots of hidden cameras. It just, it and he just got looked, second. He ended up getting. You just did he get go out and do some. No, I don't think no. he got second. No, he, he, he was the last guy on uh, the wheel of. Yeah, yeah, he was the last right. guy on the wheel of Sagan, but uh, you know, yeah. the, that, those second. those ten minutes of extra soccer playing that got in his legs, and he couldn't follow him. I know, it's my fault. <laughs> let's, let's talk about some of those. Let's spend some time on some of the other categories. Uh, another thing to note: so they did not include. Um, the U23 category, which was a real, uh, certainly a bummer uh, for those kids and a bummer for me personally with Matthew Riccatello, who was completely focused on the world's, you know, had they been in Switzerland as they moved them to, to Italy, they took uh, those categories out just to minimize the risk and exposure. But uh, Matthew was, shit, this kid, gosh, another 20, golly, I can't help myself. It's just, I cannot help my, you know, some people, they're just sick. They did. And I didn't, I didn't even think about it. It just, it just came out like that. But uh, Matthew was here in Aspen training uh, for the world's an absolutely crushing fool. So bummer for, the, for him and for all of his, uh, his fellow competitors. But, you know, we've got the time trials. We've got both men's and women's. Uh, obviously, the big story in the women's time trial was the crash of Chloe Digert. If you have a queasy stomach, do not go poke around on the Internet and look for photos of this crash. We saw the video right away, and then we saw the the, the carnage uh, almost right after. Th- this is one of the grossest things you can see in a bike race. These guardrails that that exist all over the world, you know, the backside of them or certain sides of them, they're like knives. And so, the, <clears throat> if you do have a tough stomach and you want to go down that rabbit hole, you'll see what happens when you hit when you slide across a guardrail. But uh, it was an awful crash. She was obviously uh, the big favorite. 
Uh, the, the, the update is that she's expected to make a full recovery. Uh, she had surgery to repair the tendon. Uh, she's in good spirits and, and certainly our, our, you know, we're sending her our best wishes. I actually tried to get her to come on today. She's like, LA, uh, I'm not in good shape. I haven't, I haven't showered since the crash. And so <laughs> may, maybe, uh, maybe another time. And I was like, yeah, no problem. I understand. But, um, she, ha- she would have won the, the time trial, but by the way, you know, she was, yes. she was yeah, definitely the best, be- the best split time. And, you know, that was, she would have for sure be world champion again. Mm. So, yeah. And not to mention, she wasn't able to race the whole year in the world championship jersey. Mm. So that kind of, that's a major bummer. And, uh, but we're all very happy that it sounds like she needed a full recovery and we'll see her back at the top level here again soon. Yeah. yeah, but you know, I mean, the women's it's still, you know, even with with Chloe Dygert out, still, uh, you know, an amazing, amazing victory for uh, Anna van der Breggen, who's you know very established name in in women's cycling. Forty seven point five kilometers average, by the way, in the time trial. Wow. Yeah. So Chloe would probably have gone forty eight point five or something like that. So uh, it was a fast course, but it, I mean, these speeds are amazing. Um, but yeah, Anna van der Breggen got, I mean, what a, what a, what a last few weeks for her, you know, she, she won the, the world, the world championships time trial. I mean, thanks to the crash of, of Chloe Dygert. I mean, and she knows that she, uh, 10 days before that, she won the Giro, the, the tour of Italy for women. Thanks to the crash of, uh, Annemiek van Vleuten, who was solidly leading, um, she broke her wrist and and that's actually i think an amazing story to to talk about for this for the world championship so she uh she dropped out on the second to last day of the giro and broke her wrist had surgery and 9 days later she was at the start of the world championships on the road and did an amazing lead out for uh, the attack of anna van der breggen who is you know double world champion she won the time trial and the uh, and the road race, and on top of that, Van Vleuten with a broken wrist finished second. I mean, and, you know, and I don't know where where's the boomstick? Because JB is the boomstick in Austin, because that that deserves a damn boomstick <laughs> right there. Yeah. yeah, we'll give her the boomstick. And Man, she went all she's, in. She set the major, incredibly hard pace on that last climb, uh, out of the saddle the whole way with a recently operated on wrist. Pretty incredible what uh, she did. Yeah, I've yes. I've heard some I've heard some stories. So she's uh, this year she was racing on Mitchelton Scott, right? Uh, Annemiek van Vleuten, and she joins the 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 men's team in the spring for for training camps. And it was I mean here in in Spain uh, she did a training camp with uh, with the men, and she was like fourth or fifth on the top of every climb. There was fourth or fifth. I mean, it's, she's amazingly strong. Hmm. Damn. Yeah. And then we also had the uh, men's time trial championships that uh, yeah. went down yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, all the... A few days ago. Two, yeah. A couple days ago. Yeah. It was, it was Friday. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, all the big favorites were there. You know, um, Ron Dennis was there. Grant Thomas was there. Campenarts. Uh, uh, who else? I mean, Wout van Aert, who's, you know, he, he can do everything. Uh, Walt van Aert finished second, so two times second. Tech, second in the time trial world championships and second in the in the road. Uh, but yeah, beaten by a new name, um, Filippo Ghana, young rider. Uh, I think he's 24 years old. Um, he's riding on Team Ineos. Um, but, you know, he's not a, he's, it's, he's a four-time world champion on the track. Um, and plus he has the world record four-kilometer pursuit in four minutes, two seconds. Golly. You know, imagine, imagine way, that those speeds. You know, it's, that's 35 miles an hour. Oh, I mean, it's a lot faster because it's standing start. It's standing oh. start. So, I mean, wow. um, so you know, it was not, it was you, not you, a surprise you, because you don't, have to, he, you don't have to be so detailed and, <laughs> and right all the time. I mean, this is amazing. I mean, I'm by just the way, stating facts. I'm just stating I know. facts. I, and it's, it, it makes it that much more impressive. And, and by the way, he did not do the Tour de France. So I actually now thinking back on it, I thought y'all were talking about the time trial. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, the time trial is different different animal it's all about specific training and you know this actually probably harmed somebody like Bob Bernard who wasn't able to actually ride his time trial bike at all or do any kinds of effort so the fact that he still was right there relatively close to Ghana is just incredibly impressive yeah yeah but Ghana did you know the uh, in Tireno which was together with the Tour de France right 
He won that last time trial, and it's always the same course, you know, always the same conditions. He won the last time trial by a lot. Um, on on Campanarts, I think, who's who's the world record holder for the hour. Uh, but more more importantly, he broke uh, an old record of Fabian Cancellara, who had the course record by like 15 seconds, and it was only 10 kilometer time trial. So mm. that basically, you know, said already that he was, you know, it was going to be very very difficult to beat him. Mm. Hmm. Well, for, yeah, I gotta, forgive me for jumping around, guys, but one of the other things in my notes w- was Alaphilippe was was asking for time checks constantly. He <laughs> he had no idea how far ahead, and it was old school from the motos. Uh, why is that at World Championships that they can't communicate with radios? Yeah, because I, I, they and I had they, I had forgotten that. Um, mm-hmm. I, you know, I, you never know if the team car is too far behind or if the radio. Look, these radios don't always work. Um, and, but I had forgotten that they're not allowed in the world championships until we were doing our, our pre-show notes, but Johan, you, you got some, um, some scoops on that. Yeah. I mean, it, I think it's, you know, it, I don't remember when exactly they, uh, they started with these, the, the banning of the radios in the world championships. I mean, this is the, you know, this is the UCI's event, so they can do whatever they want, you know, and they, this, this became all part of, of, you know, it's more a political debate you know the radios the teams want to have radios because it's their property it's the way they communicate they also you know they have images and sound which the teams want to sell to to you know to make the broadcasting more interesting and uh, so but uci went against it so in these kind of races there is no uh radio communication um um today for i don't think today was was not really necessary that's you know it was basically the strongest guys are in the front um but yeah and i th- i think there's i mean i've heard rumors today that uh the uci uh, president uh, lapartien is actually trying to install a complete ban on on race radios which i, I think is you know makes no sense you know why would you go against technology technology advantage you know I mean, the, the the nowadays the cyclists all these young riders that's how they've grown up you know i mean they've grown up with this is basically how they learn to race a bike um so yeah there's there's talks about uh not allowing them anymore which i, I don't know i don't know how, what what the alternative is going to be because it's not just for race strategy it's there's a, it's a lot about safety also you know uh, in, in other races when they don't know the course uh, today for example you can say okay safety is not an issue because you know, you know, you've done the the race nine times, the, the course nine times, so there's no surprises. But you know, when you go from point A to B, it's impossible to know the whole course. You know, so so yeah, there's uh, there's a debate going on uh, about not allowing radios anymore in the future. Well, and uh, I go, uh, we've we've touched on this before, and I I I disagree as you do, Johan. Uh, I don't know where you sit on this, George. I'd like to know in a sec, but I, I would raise it a level like not don't mm. ban it i would actually embrace it and mm-hmm. view it as content you know if, if you know as i you know i love watching nascar and watching jimmy race but you know if, if you you can go on to the app or the site and listen in on the radio communication between uh the the the, uh, the, the driver the spotters in, your, in every corner um the the crew chief it's fascinating. Like can watch these guys drive around in circles. A lot of times it's not very interesting as is long, boring stages of bike races. Open it up. Like let that be, you know, what I refer to as content. I think that'd be fascinating. Exactly. Yeah, I, agree. I agree. I mean, there's yeah. definitely a bunch of different arguments where for me, I always personally, personally saw it as a safety issue. Like you said, you know, I'm from point, point A to point B, you never know what's coming up and you're always very really on the danger zones. Um, to make sure that we're at the front, we make sure there's a dangerous corner coming out with a cliff on the other side of the road. I mean, that was always super important to me. The other side to that argument is when everybody knows that's coming, that's going to make everybody fight more for position. But that was never an issue for me personally. So I just preferred to know when the dangerous spots were going. In a race like today, with, a, which it, with it being a circuit, there's still a lot of old school communication going on. One or two riders from each designated team would be designated to go back and talk to the director to get information, to get changes in strategies. And these guys are the best of the best. They're able to communicate really well amongst each other throughout the race and, and really make a lot of the on the road decisions with some of the older guys like Val Verde and that they're basically team directors as well. So they can make calls on the bike with their teammates right next to them. Yeah. I have a good solution. Actually, I just thought about it. I have a really good solution to, 
to let radios uh, be a part of cycling. Okay. It's, 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 it's all about ownership. Who owns, who owns the images and who owns the sounds? Let's just give the ownership of the sound to the UCI, and I can guarantee you that radios will uh, be allowed. Well, yeah, you know, that... <sighs> I, I, well, I, you know, that might that might be the easiest way to to stop the debate, but the, the athlete. Listen, I always fall on the side of the athletes here. If you don't course, own, if you don't own if your content and and the you know the work you're doing, and then you know the the, the athlete owns that. Which yeah. And anyhow, look, we all agree, right? Yeah. No, no, it's, 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 it's the, it's the eternal debate about ownership. You know I mean? That's why that's, for example, why teams don't have more initiative to put cameras on their bikes in the Tour de France, because the Tour de France says we own the space. So we own everything that's going on in an event. The UCI wants this. So, you know, I don't understand why they cannot sit together because, and, and just, you know, make the make the whole thing bigger i mean it would be so much more of an asset to the broadcast and and more attractive for the for the viewers yeah i think we've all seen those clips when when you have a breakaway when like we saw today and then they cut to uh in car camera Mm -hmm. with it with the director and the driver the team support and they're going nuts they're going Mm -hmm. crazy uh we're losing that whole element of uh exactly excitement So, so it, look, it's the same debate around power meters. And, and my answer to that is, this, is the same answer. Make it mm-hmm. public. Like, like make mm-hmm. that stuff, put that stuff out, right? And that'd be fascinating for fans to, I mean, the riders would have to, you know, they'd have to adjust and know that, that their competitors, mm-hmm. the, the directors are back in the car, either listening to them or seeing their real-time power data. But that's, dude, that's content. It's 2020. All that, all that yeah. shit ought to be, God, there's another 20. What am I down? 60? And 80. Know, 80? Oh, damn. Yeah. Oh, 80, 100. 80 on one show. <laughs> um, that ought to, that ought to, that, that's just interesting but stuff. The, the, thing, the thing is, Lance, you know, it, it is out there. So there's, there's, a, there's a group of teams, you know, I think it's 11 teams. They're called, they're called Villon. And they are producing all this content. So they have, they have power meters, they have images, and they have sound. And they're putting it out. But guess what? They're getting sued by the UCI. Right. So, well, you know, look again, we, as we said in the tour this, we talked for days about how to resolve these issues. So mm-hmm. maybe we should actually have a dedicated show where we just lay out and we should put some thought into this, where you lay out sort of a, a, a master plan for, for modern cycling, modern, modern cycling. Cause they probably call this modern cycling, but, um, Let's let's put that to rest for now, and then yes. We'll, um, but I gotta hey, I want to share this with y'all. I got a funny. This is some funny shit right here. God, <laughs> I'm, I'm done. Even I'm I done. think I'm at one twenty now, but uh, uh, somebody will be counting. So I get uh, we get a, a good friend of ours, uh, Deborah Gillum. Is she sent me a text yesterday, and she says, "Hey Lance, I'm in Cabo for a long weekend celebrating a friend's fiftieth." It's a group from Louisiana, and one of the guys is a huge fan of the podcast. You make his Tour de France experience so much better. It's fun to meet people that dig the move. He's a bit drunk, but he keeps saying, let's make party. (laughs) (laughs) And always talking about douches. That's too funny. (laughs) It's so funny. And so I sent him a little video, and at the end of the video, I said, I was seeing the douches. (laughs) Uh, I'm dying to know what the uh, story is behind your uh, your your poster over your shoulder there, Lance. Yeah, you know I'm not trying to drum up any controversy because uh, this could c- cut both ways. But my good friend and my favorite artist uh, to ever live is Ed Rochet, the the great Ed Rochet. Uh, he's gotten to be a dear friend of mine. So he all of a sudden, and he told me he was sending this. He made these uh, posters and signed them uh, for Lance and Anna. Uh, I love Ed. Uh, he's just he's he's an icon. And so, uh, you know, that's his, that's his riff on this election. You know, I'm not, you know, the, as George likes to keep us, we're totally apolitical, but, uh, but the bottom part in the blue, you know, no matter what side you're on, get out there and vote too much. There's too much on the line right now in America. This, this shit's crazy. All right. Yeah, that's crazy. There goes another one. Yeah, but that, that, one, that one, that one, I'll pay, I'll pay for that one. Cause this shit is crazy <laughs> right now. And so I don't, you know, whatever side you're on, get out there. Hey, I, I, sh- I want to read the email Higgs sent us about uh, 
the mm. mood detox. This was great. It's been four days since the mood and the tour ended, and things have gotten bad, like real bad. It started off as a mild case of anticlimax on Monday morning, but by nightfall, I was in cold sweat. Involuntary tapping the refresh button on my iPlayer, mumbling something about Mr. Momentum over and over again. <laughs> then came the shakes. Not the protein shakes from the feed, the shake shakes from the fear. By Wednesday, I was a jabbering wreck. I wandered from douche to douche, but it meant no living soul. <laughs> Wasn't that where I was supposed to see you? In and Thursday douches. now, all I can do is lay curled up in my yellow pajamas like a dehydrated rag doll, wondering, when will they be back? And how will I make it till then? Miss y'all. Thank you, Burn. <laughs> well, you know what? We're wow. back. We're we're back. We're um, back. And and slight update. We're not not just are we here right now. Uh, next weekend is Liège Beston Liège, one of the great bike races. You talk about a, a hard bike race, and typically uh, the best person wins on the men's and women's side. But that's and that's now. Of course, that would normally be in in April. That's now going to be next weekend. Um, and I almost thought you said. Uh, you said shakes. I, I thought you might have said sheiks because uh, we were talking about the sheiks during the tour, you know, make party because they won the tour uh, with Pogachar on Team UAE. But so George and I are actually heading out Thursday uh, to that part of the world. So it's going to be interesting. It's about 8 p.m. or 7 p.m. when the race finishes. So George and I will be together. We're going to do our damn best to make sure we, we can uh, zoom in. If not, it's, we're going to leave it up to, to the two JBs. But, you know, George and I, we're big, you're big time guys, you know, with the, the, the sheiks want to hang, you know, they want to hang. Um, and we're doing some other cool stuff. We're doing a really cool and all this will unfold over the next week, but we're doing an incredible uh, charity event. I won't, I won't give away too many details because I don't know if it's ready to be public, but uh, George and I are doing a charity ride over there um, that, that, that's just for me is going to be uh, next level special, you know, they, the, uh, um, more details to come. I'll leave it at that. I'm glad you brought it up. I should probably tell my wife that I'm going to at least next week. You know, that's, that's yeah, probably, that's, a, good that's probably I mean, a good idea. I mean, seeing as you can't, uh, you, you get in trouble because you, for going out and then you're getting nervous because she's listening to the live show. Yeah, you probably ought to let her know that you're going to be gone for like eight or nine days. Okay, I'll do this after. But you know what? I and 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 I got you a jizzy. Okay, I know you wouldn't go without a jizzy. Oh, jeez. <laughs> hey, I'm Mr. Simple, all right? You guys know me. Yeah. Well, okay. Well, I'll get you a Qatar Airlines seat 32F, right in the middle. <laughs> What else by, we got? The way, by, by the way, Liège, Baston Liège, uh, first, I mean, probably the second time because there's, uh, there's also, there's Flesh Wallon on Wednesday, mm. by the way. Uh, it's kind of weird to think about that, right? And, and, but anyway, we're going to see Fri Julien Alaphilippe for the first time in his world championships jersey. So that's going to be interesting. And, you know, those races are his favorite classic. So we may see uh, a world champion win one of these races. Well, you, you, yeah, you would think there'd be some sort of a, a decompression after this, but keep in mind, uh, both these races, of course, they're in the French speaking part of Belgium, but they're in Belgium and he rides for a Belgian team. So how cool would that be, you know, to, mm -hmm. to, to win one of those monuments or both of those monuments in the rainbow Jersey for the Belgium? I mean, the, 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 it's maybe not the same pressure as tour Flanders for quick step, but you know, it's a, it's a big I race. Know. I don't know, man. The sensitive side of me says, Let's make party. Let the man party. Just finish no, the tour. No, no, no. He's no. He'll make party tonight. Party. Okay. By the way, he, where, he, went, he, he, he wins know, the world not, championships with with like a what? What did you tell me during the tour, George? With like a hundred and fifty thousand dollar watch on. I mean, who does that? I think two fifty. Two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Let me just say, if Julian's listening. I sure as hell hope somebody gave him that watch. I mean, anybody spends two hundred fifty grand on a watch and he just get their head checked. <laughs> and not to mention guys it'll be the second day of the giro when we're There's covering so liege this is so yeah. bizarre so yeah, bizarre. bizarre so bizarre all right well you know hopefully uh hopefully uh pretty boy and i can 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 jump on with you guys uh next weekend and what we can actually do is is also cover flesh at that time so for you for our yeah. man having cold sweats and in his yellow pajamas we're not going anywhere we'll be, we'll be around We'll see you in the douches from Dubai. You're not supposed to say where we're going. 
You're supposed <laughs> to keep it broad. Oh, broad. Okay. Well, that was one of the problems. God. <laughs> Unbelievable. You, now, now is probably a good time to go tell your wife that you're going somewhere. We can edit it out. That's what we <laughs> <we're>... <laughs> All right. Hey, congrats to Julian Alaphilippe and all the other... I, I, I would try to pronounce her name, but I just can't. I screw up all these names. You know, why don't you fill me in here? Because yeah. So Anna van der Breggen is Anna the double world champion. Anna, Anna van, van der Breggen. Anna van der Breggen. Van der Breggen, yeah. Godverdomme. Double world champion in the, the women's race. And Filippo Ghana is the world champion time trial. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thanks for tuning in, everybody. We'll see you, uh, well, hopefully see you next weekend for the coverage of the Ardennes Classics. Okay. See you in the douches. Thanks, guys. Ciao.